Welcome everyone to today's webcast, Ignite Mainframe Agility with Topaz. My name is Jim Liebert and I'm one of the CompuWare product managers for Topaz. And I'm Steve Kanza, another CompuWare Topaz product manager. For today's agenda, we're going to be focusing on how a developer can use Topaz as a force multiplier to be more productive and deliver more business value. So welcome to CompuWare, everyone. Now, when we do UX design work, we do it with personas. So we keep a programmer in mind and we work directly for that person. One of our personas is a woman named Megan. She's a recent college graduate who's been working on the mainframe for six months. And because she's very technical, she picked up the languages really quick. So she's comfortable in COBOL and JCL. And what she still is challenged with is those idiosyncrasies of the mainframe itself and also just the sheer complexity of the mainframe application. So here is our virtual Megan looking at one of our JIRA stories that's next on deck in this sprint. And here's the JIRA story. And for her corporation, it looks like they're bumping up the commission for sales that come out of California when they're point of sales so the salesperson can earn a slightly higher commission. If you look in the details of the story, the uh, Megan's mentor has pointed her at some JCL, but also suggested that if this gets too complicated, she can wait till the mentor comes back into the office. Megan decides she knows where that JCL is, so she decides to go ahead and take a look and see if she can figure it out on her own. And this is where Topaz comes in. So she's going to begin using Topaz to analyze the requirements for this story, and then if she decides to take it, to actually work with it. Now she's used that JCL before, so she actually defined a project that points at those JCL members. And now she's going to begin just by kind of eyeballing one of those JCL members that the mentor referred her to, just to make sure there aren't any production data sets or that kind of thing. It, it all looks okay, so the next logical step is actually to run it. And here she ran it, and it, it's, uh, you know, it's just a functional test, so it came back really quick, and it also worked. She clicks on the link to open up the JAZZ output. So it looks like her mentor was right as she can run the JCL. And now she scrolls down until she finds the sales file, which is kind of the file of interest in this case. And she's going to open that up in file A. And so now she can start to get a feel for what the contents of the sales file is. And if you remember, the, the directions said you want to adjust the sales point commission, and she can see that that field in this VSAM file, the sales point commission. So now she's starting to get a feel for this assignment. She um, has JCL to execute it. She can look at the sales file, and she knows the field within the sales file, kind of the field of interest. The next step she's going to do is she's actually going to run Expediter in this program now. This, is, this has been a technique used for generations by mainframe programmers to use Expediter to begin understanding programs that they haven't previously worked on. So here I'm just going to debug this JCL as a batch job. And I'm going to do one extra step, and that's I'm going to activate what's known as visualization. And you'll see, you'll see why Megan does that in a short while. All right, so we, we hit our first break point inside this job. And this is, this is one area where Megan picked up the mainframe really quick because in Topaz, it uses the same debugging framework that she was comfortable with when she was working on Java programs 
during school. And it has all those kind of capabilities that you associate with a debugger. You can see the value of fields. Uh, for instance, hovering over a field will give you the value of the field. You can set breakpoints with just a click. You can set more complicated breakpoints with the when condition. You can add watch variables so you can watch as variables change content. Another thing you can do that this is unique to Topaz is you can also right click and do what's known as generate unit tests. And the, the, the capability that we're showing here is our Topaz for total test uh, component of Topaz. And what's unique about this is it allows you to generate a, a unit test based off your debug session, but it also allows you to generate stub data, virtual data for the, the sub-programs that may be called or in the interactions to DB2 or vSAM. So it allows someone like Megan to create a automated unit test that then she can run repeatedly as she's modifying that, that code and ensure that she hasn't broken something and understands the program behavior. Now, Megan isn't going to do that now because that is not her mission at hand in this case. Now, as she begins to work on the program, she'll use the unit tests. Really, what, all she's going to do now is just let this expediter session run to completion without even setting any breakpoints. And that's because what she's after is that visualization to give her more background information on this application and the changes that she, the story is asking her to make. So here's the visualization. And what this does is it records, as the application is running, it records the activity that occurred during that application. So what programs called what programs, how many times, if they did I.O. to MVS files, what kind of I.O. it did, if it did I owed, if it did DB2, what kind of SQL calls it made. So for instance, here we can see that this application that she ran did 15 selects from this DB2 table. And it did uh, 15 writes to that vSAM file. And of course, again, our file of interest is this sales file, and we can see that we did 15 re reads and 15 rewrites. So this, we know now that this application is updating that sales file. And more importantly is we've honed in on the program that's doing the work is this P9400COM. So again, Megan is kind of building a reservoir of information on an application that she may previously have been very cold coming in very cold. So now she knows the name of the file, the name of the field of interest within the file, and the name of the program that manipulates that file so she can go in and change the commission for those California salespeople. And with that, she feels confident enough that she can handle this change, and now she's ready to start in on the change. So Megan has created an assignment uh, in ISPW, and in that assignment, she's added the file that she needs to change. So she's, she's now ready, and ISPW is, is a mainframe source control system. So Megan has everything that she needs in order to start making her changes to her code. Now, if we take a step back and think a little bit about what we're actually doing here is, um, you know, lots of times people kind of categorize Topaz as a, uh, a new version of ISPF, or sometimes they'll categorize it as a UI into the classic CompUR product. And really, it does so much more than that. It's really designed to provide the ability for a programmer to move fast when doing mainframe development. And really, we do that by concentrating on two things. 
One is we often refer to it as mainstreaming the mainframe, and what that actually means is providing the same kind of capabilities when you're doing mainframe development as when you're doing open systems development. So as a new programmer comes into mainframe development, they're not required to learn the tools, it's just the actual language and the operating system they can concentrate on. And then the second thing we'll concentrate on is giving them the capability to understand these complicated applications. Since so many mainframe applications are decades old, they're very complicated, and Topaz is really designed to understand that. So now let's go back to Megan, and for working with this program, this P94COM that she identified as the program of interest to complete this story. So Megan has the, the, the program. She's made the changes to the program. She's now ready to analyze that program to understand where to make those changes. Right, so she has it checked out to Dev1. And now what she wants to do, again, she's identified that this is the program that manipulates the sales file. Now she has to understand where in this program it manipulates this. And for this, we're going to actually do what's known as perform program analysis. And this gives her a little more information. For one thing, it, it does static analysis of the code and it builds a flow chart. And of course, for complicated programs, you know, that flow chart can be very complicated. Right? But another thing she can do is she has the ability to create kind of what I call heat maps. So in our case, we're interested in, you know, where in this program does it manipulate that sales file? So for instance, we could colorize this by where, what paragraphs actually do file AO. And what this identifies by the richness of the color, which paragraphs do file AO. And from here, we could just kind of hover and find out who does sales. For instance, this paragraph opens the sales file. And this paragraph actually updates the sales file. So this looks like our paragraph of interest when we actually want to locate who's doing the I.O. to that file. Another thing that Megan can do is kind of use um, you know, divide and conquer strategies to make this flow chart a little more understandable. So she knows that this paragraph does the I.O. to that file and it's called from this paragraph that's then called from this paragraph. Well, she could kind of limit the size of her flow chart to just like isolate the area of interest for her. Another thing she can do is if you remember The field that she was interested in was actually a sales commission field. So now what she could look at is actually bring up what's known as the data flow for that field. And what this shows is everywhere in this program where data flows into that field or flows from that field. And if you click on any of these connectors, it'll actually sync up the code and take you to that line of code. And it's presented both visually and also as a table. So here you could think of this table as kind of a to-do list where Megan is interested in this commission field and she wants to find the right place to put in her new calculation to bump up the commission for California salespeople. So now she can kind of work through every reference of that field and find her way to where the appropriate place is to make her change. Now we're gonna leave Megan to make her change, so we don't, you know, there's no value in just watching someone type in COBOL statements. So with a flick of the wrist here, she has completed that work, so good on her, and now we're gonna move on to the next step. So now Megan has, has done her changes, she's created that automated uh, unit test with Topaz, and she's going to go ahead and do one last compilation just to make sure everything is working correctly, and she's going to go and run the, the automated unit test 
uh, as soon as that compilation is done to make sure that everything is working. And the automated unit test in this case is something that she's creating and leaving for future developers that may have to modify this program. Now they have an automated unit test that runs the scenario of the modifications to that sales calculation. So they can ensure that that functionality remains functioning in the way that Megan has designed, coded, and tested it to work. So we're going to go ahead and run, run, make sure that uh, run the total test and make sure that everything uh, is still working, functioning correctly. So here we see the results of our test, and that total test that we created through Expediter actually generated 197 tests, and you can see here that after she made her changes, the 197 tests completed successfully. Now, again, it's, it's nice at this point to take a step back, and the, really the concept of unit testing on the mainframe is effectively unheard of. and so. The mainframe does not have this reservoir of tests that you can throw at applications to guarantee that they're working at any given moment. And so the risk is, particularly with very complex applications, is that the programmer will make a change that successfully completes their requirement, but it'll have unintended consequences in other areas. And without this kind of unit testing capability, that will often escape and find its way into production. But here, Megan, as part of her process of making these changes, she's able to generate these unit tests. So moving forward, as someone else begins to work on this same application, they'll have these tests to rely on to avoid that escape and those unattended consequences. So now that she's confident that the, the unit tests are working, she's made the changes, she is going to go ahead and promote that code from the dev level where she was working on it with up into the QA level. And at that QA level, we've, we have an automated CI process that's been configured to run through an automated code check. So you can see that the promotion occurred and through ISPW uh, webhook functionality, we've triggered this Jenkins continuous integration process. And the continuous integration process is going to run through several steps. It's going to retrieve the code and another total test test suite that will execute a functional regression test, this time not with data stubs, but with a live data file. And then it's going to execute that total test suite. And based off that total test suite execution, it will, it will push the metrics into Sonar Cube where there can be an automated code review. So in this case, you can see that, that we've failed that automated code review. And we're going to go in and look at what occurred there. So we'll go and open up Sonar Cube, do a refresh here, um, and it doesn't look like the data is processed yet in the Sonar Cube, but what we would see is a failed quality gate based off issues that were detected in that Sonar Cube. So through this automated process, we're able to ensure that quality is built into this pipeline and the pipeline is automated, so it's not a set of manual steps, but things that occur automatically for, um, for the developer, for Megan, without her having to drive all these processes manually. Now, another thing, because Megan is of the measure twice, cut once category, she can also go back and do some checks on her file. Remember, 
those unit tests, you can data stub them so they don't actually touch data. But when we did the promote, we actually ran using data. So now she has an actual sales file that reflects her changes. And she could, she can take a look at that sales file. So let's go ahead and do that. And she can kind of eyeball her changes. And if you, if you remember, you know, it was for California sales that were point of sales. She was, she gave them a slight bump in commission and it was not to exceed $100. So here she could actually uh, take out a pen and paper and see if $37.99 is the appropriate commission for a sale of $345.40. Another thing she could do here is now she has this test file that reflects her changes, but the QA group still has a same, you know, functional test file that doesn't reflect her changes. So she could run a compare of those two files. So again, here we're going to compare our updated file with the QA group's file that reflects the old changes. So this is a compare where we're expecting differences. But the important thing is, are they exactly the differences we did expect? And here you can see that we actually have two changed records. And if we click on that, we'll get the detail of those records. And again, we only want the changed fields to be for CA records, California records, and only the sales point commission. And we can actually do another test. Where let's take the sales point commission out of the compare and rerun the compare. And at this point, we would expect them to exactly match because we've removed the, the only field we should have changed. And there on the right, you can see no differences were found. So here, kind of a lot happened here in a very short time, in less than a half hour. But to kind of summarize, Megan picked, picked up the JIRA story, saw the JCL it referenced, and saw the file that it referenced. She ran the JCL through the visualizer to see what program affected that file. She then checked out that program. She used program analysis to figure out where to make her change. She made her change. She ran the unit test to test the change. She ran these compares to test the change. So she's, um, at this point, she's fairly confident that she's ready to go. And this, this is what we were getting at with kind of our cryptic title, Ignite Mainframe Agility. And this is the ability to speed up that mainframe development by providing the exact tools that that developer wants. So let's talk a little bit about what Steve showed us as we went through Jenkins and SonaCube. Yeah, and the, the slide that is now showing shows how mainframe can be included in a DevOps tool chain. And one of the things that we've we've heard consistently from our customers is they no longer want the mainframe to exist as a silo within their organization. They want to break down those walls and have the mainframe viewed as just another server. It might be a very large server, but they, they want that the, the same capabilities, the same ability to continuously deliver business value to be able to leverage automation in best in class tool sets from CompuWare and other leading DevOps tool vendors to make the mainframe have a, a new presence, a new capability and enable their workforce to have these capabilities as a force multiplier. So what we showed is how Topaz as an integrated IDE has the capabilities to be able to analyze code, to be able to edit code, validate that code, and, um, and be able to then trigger version control, interact with version control, and trigger things like continuous integration 
and leverage automated code quality scans with tools such as Topaz for Total Tests and Sonar Cube. And this is one part of a larger picture. Obviously, once Megan corrects the issues and is ready to push those changes up into higher level environments, you can leverage tools such as Zebia Labs with Mainframe to have automated deployments uh, out to your higher level staging and production environments. And then also leverage tools to monitor those environments and feed information back into the overall process to make sure that the code that's running in production, you understand the, the metrics, you understand the add that may be occurring in production, and you can improve those programs in the future to be able to deliver better biz business value and more biz business value in the future. So now that was kind of a broad look at Compure's Topaz Workbench. And you might be thinking at this point, and I wouldn't blame you if you were, is that these two product managers for the product might be coming in with a little bias. And you'd be right. However, we do have, we have shown this to industry analysts and we have customers that also rave about it. So this is some nice validation that from the industry analysts that they recognize Compure as a thought leader here and from our C-level and management level people from our customer base that they see this as a valuable addition to their portfolio. And at Compuware, we, this, this leads us both proud of where, where Topaz exists today and also excited at where it can go tomorrow. Now, this is kind of macro reviews, but both Steve and I have to obsess about micro reviews because our obsession is making the individual programmer more productive. So they can produce code faster, uh, better quality code, and more importantly, that they can do it in a quick enough manner so the organization gets the benefit of the business value of those changes. Or within the context of this presentation, what Steve and I strive for is the Megan seal of approval. Thank <laughs> you.